Hello for Lava, this is Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. I'm Susana Suiswiki. E hari ake nei. They are more likely to get cervical cancer and twice as likely to die from it. A health campaign encouraging bus figure women to self-test launches soon. Also, it is words that literally can mean the sinking or the surviving of our islands. Climate change activists calls out the US and UK for failing Pacific countries. And later, are we done yet? A mural in Rarotonga is taking longer than expected to complete. Pacifica women in New Zealand are almost twice as likely to die from cervical cancer compared to the rest of the population. This is according to the National Cervical Screening Programme, which is organising an event this weekend in Wellington, encouraging Pacifica women to undergo cervical screening. Kuroi Hawkins spoke with the programme service coordinator, Harriet Tychert. How bad is cervical cancer among Pacifica and, and why is there a disparity in the rate of incidence compared to other groups? Um, Figures released by the National Screening Unit in June this year showed that cervical screening rates for Pacific people are nearly 12% lower than mainstream groups. They are more likely to get cervical cancer and twice as likely to die from it compared to our European counterparts. In other words, Pacific women are 1.5 times more likely to be diagnosed with cervical cancer and approximately two times more likely to die from it compared to European women. So the, the National Cervical Screening Programme targets for screening is 80% of the eligible population screened regularly. However, Pacific women are only at 57%. So we know that Pacific um, uh, people face inequities and cost, and cost barriers in accessing cervical screening services as well. So to reduce those barriers, cervical screening is now free for Pacific people and also other under-screened groups as well. I understand there's a new HPV self-test. Can you describe this and how much of a difference you hope it will make and why? Um, the new vaginal swab test looks for the human papilloma virus, which causes more than 95% of cervical cancers. So people can choose to do the self-test themselves in privacy, in a clinic, or at a trained health professional um, assisting them. Um, the cervical sample test previously called SMEAR is still available as an option and may be recommended for some other situations. Um, but this is a much easier and more simpler uh, way to do the test. It's like using the COVID nose swab, but it's a vaginal swab instead. So remember, it's a self-swab uh, test, so you can uh, keep your privates private, and it's less invasive and more effective in picking up the HPV virus that causes most cancers. So with um, with the screening campaign that was designed specifically for Pacific people, we are confident that screening rates will improve and ultimately save lives. Where can people find out a bit more about this if they are interested? Um, they can find out more through the um, the social media. There's media campaigns, also through their usual doctor or nurse at GP clinic, um, or one of our whole water providers or Pacific providers in uh, women's or community health centres, outreach services like the Marae or mobile health units, also at family plannings and all the sexual health clinics. But they can also visit and access services available by visiting the Time to Screen website um, and, and, and that they can get that information online. Pacific Youth Climate Champion Sulwafi Brianna Fruin has called out the fossil fuel industry, the US and the UK for failing Pacific countries in the fight against the climate crisis. Sulwafi made history as the youngest ever winner of the Commonwealth Youth Award and now she's in New York for the United Nations General Assembly, her first time in the UN building. She spoke with Lydia Lewis following the climate summit. 
What is your message to Australia as they bid to host COP? My message to Australia is that they have the real opportunity to champion our ocean, to champion our region, and therefore be ambitious with how they lead that space. I think um, that they should actually be given the hosting right if they're not actually going to be um, ambitious enough to represent our region. And what are the top priorities which would signal that they are being ambitious? I would say there's two things that they would need to, to indicate and talk about, which is one, climate financing. What are, are the um, commitments that they will make to financing those most vulnerable to climate change, including those in their, their very ocean, their neighbours in the Pacific? And two, they really need to talk about how they will phase out fossil fuels. Um, it's something that is not named in a lot of the spaces in which not only Australia speaks in, in the climate space, but the UK, the US, uh, but coal, oil and gas needs to be something that's addressed. And the plan on how this will be phased out needs to be talked about. And Australia and the US, they were not, uh, from my, what I understand from this press conference, invited or allowed to speak at the UN on climate summit. Mm. Um, yes, um, I can speak briefly about it as it was a, a secretariat, a UN secretariat decision. But from what, what I understand, this summit was for the movers and the doers. So those who have been moving and who have been doing the actions in which they talk about. And so because Australia and the US were examples of countries that have not been moving at the same speed as which they've been talking, they were not invited to speak. And even the US, who had a rep, we're currently in the US, this is where the, the meeting is, they had a representative in the room, I believe, John Kerry, and he was not allowed to speak. And that's because we wanted, the UN wanted to give the voices to those who have been ambitious ambitious to be able to speak on the Climate Ambition Summit. And being your first time, tell me more Mm -hmm. about your experience and how you view this time for you. Yeah, I think um, it's so important to have young people in the room and to have civil society, people who actually aren't getting paid to be here. You know, and that's something you notice when you sit in these rooms is is a lot of these people, it's their job to be here from nine to five or or for whenever the the conference starts. And then you look around at the young people, the civil society, the the volunteers, the indigenous people who made their way into the room, which I want to mention very few did. Um, You you know that they're there because of passion and because of heart. This is not not, um, job work. This is heart work for us. And I think we need more heart in these rooms and we need more, more and so I commend um, the UN for inviting those of us who did make it in the room. But I, I think um, and I hope that there's more space in the future. Looking forward for the next few weeks, what else are you attending and what is on your radar? I've been following the Pacific ministerials who've been talking about the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty and how we can push this forward. I, it's important that we name the culprit um, in this space and that we find ways outside of the UN system to push a non-proliferation in another treaty. So that's um, most of the work I'll be doing here. And then I'm also um, engaging with a a lot of our young people here um, that live in America and that live in the global South that have gathered here for the UN General Assembly to see how we can um, really strengthen our movement as as youth who, who want to see change. That was Lydia Lewis speaking with Pacific Youth Climate Justice activist Sulwafi Brianna Fruin, who is in New York for the UN Climate Summit. The United States is urging more Pacific countries and China to join its coalition to address synthetic drug threats. Lisa A. Johnson is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs in the Department of State. Ms. Johnson says synthetic drug threats are a global problem that requires a global solution, urging more Pacific countries and China to join and help combat the growing threats in the region. Kuroi Hawkins spoke with Ms. Johnson, who was in New Zealand this week, attending the International Association of Women Police Conference. 
He began by asking her about the importance of having more women in law enforcement in the Pacific. Why we think it's so important to have women in meaningful participation in police forces, especially in leadership roles, is that research has shown it increases reporting of crime. Women bring, um, they bring a lot of diverse experiences to policing. They build trust and rapport with communities. They help us develop a more comprehensive strategy to address crime, especially victim assistance um, in the areas of sexual and domestic violence. Um, and really, it just improves the effectiveness of the police response across the force. But guess what? Only 15 percent of the world's police officers are female. Mm. So we are really trying to change that and improve the recruitment, retention and promotion of women in police where they just serve as role models for young girls who look at this and say, hey, this career is attainable to me no matter what my gender. And as we increase female participation in the police, we really see it breaks down gender stereotypes and, and promotes more inclusive policing and societies in general. Mm. So that's what I was here to do. And you can tell I'm still on a high from the earlier part of the week. Uh, the second part of my trip was to come and talk to um, officials in the New Zealand government because the United States is starting to increase our, our presence and engagement with partners in the Pacific Island countries, which is really exciting. And I'll be going to Fiji, to Suva, on, on Sunday night. Turning now to um, an area you, you know a lot about and something that we've been following in the Pacific with narcotics in the region in terms of um, the not just the, the Pacific sort of drug highway in terms of the movement of drugs, but we're also seeing a lot more bleed of the of the narcotics into actual local markets in in the Pacific Islands which is a concern uh, what what is what is the US doing in this space are you seeing what what we're reporting in media is it worse um, is the situation escalating um, it's very unfortunate in general you've already identified two of the biggest problems one is the Pacific Island countries being on transshipment routes from both Southeast Asia, methamphetamine and cocaine from Latin America, to lucrative markets in, in New Zealand and in Australia. But also, transshipment countries always end up as destination countries. It's something we have seen around the world. And so communities in the Pacific Islands will be more and more affected as people become users. And really, the, the community harm will, will increase. So it's something we want to get on top of as early as we can. Um, we are looking at how to provide additional assistance to Pacific Island countries in the counter narcotics space. Just last week, we actually funded a United Nations um, Office of Drugs and Crime training course, a regional training course that took place in Fiji for about six or seven different Pacific Island countries, specifically looking at the issues of synthetic drugs um, and precursor chemicals that go into those synthetic drugs. And that has been um, a threat that really it's a global problem that's going to require a global solution. The United States has created a global coalition to address synthetic drug threats. There was a ministerial meeting last summer, summer in the America's time, but then also a meeting on the margins of the UN General Assembly just earlier this week. Uh, Fiji is a member of the global coalition, as is New Zealand and Australia, but we really would like additional countries to join that global coalition. It's a place where we're going to be sharing best practices in how to address synthetic drug threats and the harm that they cause to communities. What are the best practices in, in treatment and rehabilitation in those spaces as well? So that's another area where we can collaborate. As, as part of the U.S. re-engagement with the, with the Pacific, we've seen a few um, security agreements signed, uh, some ship rider agreements, for example, in Papua New Guinea. Is, is any of that resource and that infrastructure and that going to be employed in this space? Um, Absolutely. We are looking to increase our partnerships with Pacific Island countries. That's that's part of why I'm here, because we, we want to do that in all different sectors. I mean, there are parts of the U.S. government who are engaged in other areas of development and climate and resilience issues. And my specific area is law enforcement and criminal justice systems. And that's the United States believes in general that the world is just a more safe, secure and peaceful place when criminal justice systems in every country function well and provide um, access to justice for all of their citizens. So that's what we would hope to build with our partnerships in the Pacific Island countries to help strengthen their capacity to do those those things. And we're looking to cooperate in a number of areas, but I've been told it's the Pacific way. I mean, in consultation, in collaboration, in discussing with them what are their needs, what do they want, and uh, what we have heard so far, the conversation is continuing, but help in, in maritime law enforcement because of threats, uh, things like um, illegal unreported, unregulated fishing, which goes to the issue of livelihoods for people who live in the Pacific Islands, uh, the drug transshipment that we heard about, the drugs that can cause harm in, in communities, 
Um, there's also an interest in, in general, rule of law and, and combating transnational organized crime, uh, different kinds of trafficking, trafficking of people, um, cybercrime. These things are affecting all countries in the world, and we want to help bring um, some ideas and, and best practices that can be adapted to the, the needs and the ways of the people who live in the Pacific Islands. What will soon be the longest mural in the South Pacific is weeks away from being completed in the Cook Islands. The mural, which is being painted on the seawall by Rarotonga's airport, was planned to be finished in October last year, but that's been delayed. Caleb Fotheringham has the story. It was meant to be a quick few months job, but rain, wind and even the sun has pushed it out. Travelling artist Gonzalo Aldana from Mexico is the main painter and came up with the idea. He wants it finished before the Pacific Islands Forum leaders meeting in November, but thinks it should be done in a few weeks. I don't want to exaggerate, but sometimes I'm just really dreaming about the moment when I do the boom, the final part of paint, or the final the moment when I have to sign it. But it has been a really beautiful journey in general. The 560-metre seawall features legends and animals from each of the 15 islands that make up the country. In a lot of ways, it's been tough work for Mr Aldana, who's done the lion's share. I have to be in certain position, sitting or, or my knees or something, and it doesn't sound like so challenging. But when you think, do it for one week, do it for one month, do it for 12 months, do it for... And then it's like, wow, I'm starting having like, like issues with my knees or sometimes my low back's like, oh, I feel something. No? The work was sponsored by Ocean Charity Psychology to showcase Marae Moana, a multi-use marine park which extends over the nation's entire exclusive economic zone, covering roughly the area of Mexico. The marine park was created in 2017 with the main purpose of protecting the ocean. One of the features are 50 nautical mile marine protected areas around each island, prohibiting large-scale commercial fishing and seabed mining. Kevin Ero, who spearheaded Marae Moana, says the mural is being painted to raise awareness of the ocean. It's a great tool, particularly for our kids, and everyone drives past the seawall and they can see and identify islands and characters and all those sorts of things that make Marae Moana what it is. Mr Ero says the Pacific Islands Forum Leaders Meeting will be a great opportunity to present the wall. I know there's going to be a lot of messaging at the PIF around our ocean how we have to look after it and maintain it. So it'll be a, a good time to get it completed and really showcase it at that event. Resort General Manager Tim Mir, who is part of Marae Moana's outreach team, has found guests are already providing a lot of positive feedback. Our guests start asking us questions about Cook Island culture, about stories that are being depicted on the wall, the ocean, about the flora and fauna of the island, and about the whole population of these beautiful 15 islands in the South Pacific. Mr Mayor says the wall was already popular among tourists who would watch low-flying planes land. Now it's become more of a talking point. That's Pacific Waves for today. Don't forget you can listen back on rnzi.com slash programs. From myself and the RNZ Pacific team, till fast 3-4.